<clears throat> well, children, there are, uh, there are not a lot of you children around this morning, but remember, you know, we always appreciate children of any age, so there is a little bit of pressure on you Lalons and, uh, well, at least one Lalonde, and uh, you Proppers, but I have a question for you that should be a relatively easy question, perhaps, and that is, what is your favorite chore? I'm assuming that you all have chores that you have to do, right? What's your favorite chore? What? You don't have favorite chores? I'm not seeing a lot of hands up. I mean, I know there's only three of you, but there's not a lot of hands. Okay, okay. What's your least... Oh, you got one? Okay, what's your favorite? Dishes. Okay. Hand washing. Do you like washing or drying or both? Washing, yeah. Washing is better than drying, I think, too. Yeah. yeah. What's, your, what's your least favorite chore? The chore you hate the most? And adults, you know, you're included in this. Feel free. I'll tell you what mine is. Mine is bringing out the garbage. Ugh. It ruins... I, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It's such a small thing. But it ruins my morning. I, I'm like, ah, the garbage! Ah! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shoveling the driveway. That's a good one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The li- the cat litter box. Yeah, that's not a not a favorite either. Anybody else a least favorite chore? Cleaning the bathroom. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Good. All right. Okay. Children and adults, we're talking about work today. We're starting a series on work. And chores, of course, are part of work. And the reality is is that we all have chores that we don't really like to do. But, but, That's not quite what God intended or created when He founded this world. Now, did God create people to work among other, like doing other things too, but did God create people to work, do you think? No? No? It's a vote, it's a survey. Do you think that God created people to work? Yes or no? There's two yeses, but the... (laughs) Yeah, there's a third yes. Okay. And there's a yes. Okay. So, yes. God definitely created people to work. And we'll talk about that later. But God didn't create that work to be quite the way we think about it now. Here's the clincher that you're going to have to pay attention to later. God created work to be something joyful and good that flows out of love and relationship. Okay? Good, joy, relationship, even when you're cleaning the cat litter. Yeah. Okay, so kids, pay attention to that. We're going to talk about what the Scriptures say first. So this morning, brothers and sisters, we are looking at the book of Genesis because we are starting our series on work with the very start of the Bible because that is the very first place in which we find work. This morning, we are looking particularly at God's good work and we are looking at what God created for us to do for work and what that is to look like. And so I want to remind us just before we read verse 26 of chapter 1, I want to remind us of what goes on before, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Okay, good. Work right away. Very first thing. In the beginning, God created work. God did work. I mean, yeah, God created bracket. That is work right? God created. The very first thing we read, 
right? And then we go through and we see that God does these things day after day after day, creating good and wonderful things. And then at the very end, after God has finished His six days of creation, He rests. There are important things there, of course, for us to remember. But before we get to God resting, we look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, wherein God says these words. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Amen. The word of the Lord. Amen. We'll look a little bit more specifically at some of that work in, in, a, in a couple of moments when we read a little bit from Genesis chapter 2. But, but for now, there are several things that we need to notice. Right? And, and some of these things you could maybe predict that I was going to tell you and talk to you about. But... Uh, I'm going to say them anyways because they're so, so absolutely critical. Notice in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, etc., etc. Okay? Let us make mankind in our image. This is the only time wherein God talks about creation amongst God's self. Right? God, all the time before this, He just says, let there be this, let there be that, let there be the other thing. God talks about it, discusses creation only when He is talking about creating people. Why is that? And if you, you, know, if you remember, that's okay. You can you know, reiterate things that I've already told you. And if you don't remember, that's also okay. You don't have to feel guilty about that. Anybody? Why does God discuss within Himself the creation of humanity? Hey Amen, Kent! Woohoo! Gold star for you. Not, not that that's the way it works. Sorry. I mean, I, I do love you, but I wouldn't love you less if you got it wrong. Just, just so you know. Right? Yeah, God discusses it within Himself because it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is a trinity. There are three people. But why is that important when God is talking about creating man? Well, it's important when God is talking about creating humanity because humanity is created in God's image. Right? The birds are not created in God's image. The sea is not created in God's image. The animals are not created in God's image. The trees and the flowers are not created in God's image. The sun and the moon and the stars are not created in God's image. Not even the light is created in God's image. Only humanity is created in God's image. That is why God discusses within God's self the creation of humanity. And what does that tell us? Well, that tells us, that hints at a hugely significant thing about how it is that we are created in God's image. It's not an accident that God talks about this within God's self at this time when He's talking about us being in His image. It is to indicate clearly that we were created to be in relationship just as God is in relationship within God's self eternally. Right? Our God is three in one. One in three. One God, three persons. Has always been, always will be 
in relationship within God's self. The Apostle John tells us in uh, his little letter, 1 John, he tells us twice that God is love. Jesus further tells us when, he, when He's asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment, singular, is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets are summarized in these two commandments. God is love. God could not be love if God was not in relationship. Love is not a thing that exists without relationship, right? So God has always been in relationship. God has always been love. And God creates people to love. And God creates people in His image. So, when people talk about how it is that we are created in the image of God, well, there are lots and lots and lots of theories that have been, throwing around, been thrown around for hundreds and hundreds of years. But the key way, as far as I can tell, based on the Scriptures, the key way that we were created in God's image is that we were created to love. First, we were created to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And second, we were created to love our neighbor as ourselves. And those are really so critical that they're basically one commandment, one reason for being, one, one underpinning for who we are. And then third, we were created, as this Scripture tells us, to be in relationship with the world God created. Right? That's what stewardship of God's creation is really all about. Taking care of. Now, here are some other questions. Is it easy always, to be in relationship. And if any of you can say yes, I would really like to talk to you later because I'd like to find out what your trick is. It's so not. Right? Gwyneth and I have this saying, not that Gwyneth and I are the uh, ultimate paragon of heaven or wedded bliss or whatever, but we, we have this saying that we are better together, right? Which is, which is great. It's, it's very, very true. We've seen it over and over and over again. But sometimes it's so hard. Even, even when we have both, which is not always the case, but even when we both have the best of intentions, and, and, and even though we have worked so hard to learn uh, the, the tools and tricks of, of marriage communication and so on and so forth, there are times when Gwyneth, love you, is almost incomprehensible to me. And I am absolutely certain that there are times when I am pretty much incomprehensible to her. And we have to work so hard to get to the place where we can finally understand each other. And, and, and that's just communication, right? That, that's not you know, going further and working together, doing things together. And that is in a relationship where we both are on the same team. We're both trying hard. We're both working at it, right? Let alone the relationship that you have with your colleague at work that you don't really like, that kind of grates you the wrong way, or, or the stranger that you meet on the subway, or, well, we don't have too many subways around here, uh, maybe at the subway, the restaurant. <laughs> boom, boom, right? Um, you know, there's so many people that you come across and some of them just rub you the wrong way and so on and so forth. And, and then, 
And then you get to the relationship of us with, with the creation. Oh, man. Right? It used to be that my father and my mother, my, my, <laughs> my father was a good Dutch fellow. Um, he is still. Well, although he's less, he's less Dutchish in this way, I, I think, than he used to be. But uh, my mom would sit down and clip out all of the coupons from all of the flyers from all of the stores in town. And she would make the list based on those coupons and, and, and things like that. And then she would put that all together in a bundle. And my dad would go, and this was before price matching, my dad would go to every store and buy the cheapest things at that store. It would take him like three hours to do the groceries, right? Because he would get the cheapest thing from every store, right? And if they didn't have it, he would make sure to get a rain check and, you know, all those sort of things. Now, that took a lot of time and a lot of effort. And, and he was trying to be stewardly with the resources God had given him. But now, <clears throat> when I'm trying to think about shopping, and this is not, again, this is not because I'm so great. It's just the stuff that's in there. I, I'm thinking about, yes, how can I make the most out of the, the financial resources that God has given us? And, <clears throat> and I'm thinking about whether or not I'm supporting my local farmers. Is, is this produce coming from uh, local? Uh, and I'm thinking about the environmental impact. Did this tuna that I have, did it get caught here in Canada and then shipped to China, and processed, and then shipped back to Canada? And I'm thinking about <clears throat> I'm thinking about how well the companies that are producing these goods treat their employees. And I'm thinking about whether monosodium glutamate is good for me or not, which it's not. And I'm thinking about all of these things. And that's just doing my groceries, let alone caring for the world. It gets complicated. And it's true for you if you're farming, if you're doing your, your whatever your trade is, right? Does the company that you work for, do they treat this world well? Right? And is it better to have no-till fields or to do tilling? And do I use Roundup or not? Or how much Roundup do I use? Or do I use genetically modified crops or not? And, and uh, so many questions. All having to do ultimately with relationships. Relationships between me and God. How do I worship Him and honor Him in everything that I do? Relationships between me and the people that I come into contact with, the people of this world. And relationships between me and this world. The earth, the creation. And a lot of that too is tied in very, very much to work. And, and sadly for us, in this world that we live in, this broken and sort of messed up world, a lot of that ends up being really onerous and burdensome. It really weighs us down. It's sad. It's annoying. We get frustrated. But that's not how work was created to be. Notice in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it does not say, in the beginning God thought, well, I better get off my butt and do something today, I guess. Got to be productive, I suppose. It's not what it says. It, it does not say, in the beginning God felt a great obligation to do something productive and useful for the good of society. It does not say that. It does not say, in the beginning, God thought that the only way He could be successful was by proving what great work He could do. 
doesn't say any of that. God created. And notice that throughout the creation story, God celebrates every day and every night, or every night and every day, God says, that's good! That's good! That's good! Right? And then when it comes to people, God says, it's very good! It's very good! And notice too that this is true also about the work that God gives to Adam and Eve. Let's look at chapter 2. Chapter 2 of Genesis. Chapter 2, verses 19 and following. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. The word of the Lord. Amen. Now for our purposes here this morning, the key things that we want to notice are having to do with the work that Adam is tasked to do and also the relationships that God gives to humanity. See, the only thing that God mentions is not good about creation is that Adam is alone. That he has no one. Now, we have to be careful with this passage because some people will take this passage and will sort of take it to mean that, that God is speaking only here about the relationship between a husband and a wife, really. But that's not true, right? God is actually speaking about relationships for people altogether. God says, let us create humanity in our image. Let us create mankind in our image. God creates mankind in His image to rule over the land and the fish and the seas and so on and so forth. And God creates them to be in loving relationship with God and with fellow man. Except, right, there is no fellow man. There is no fellow beings right now. And so we zoom in in chapter 2 and we find out that, hey, Adam's there by himself. And that's not good. Right? We were created to be in relationship. The reason we have to be careful with this is a couple of reasons we need to be careful with this. We need to be careful with this because some people will take it to mean that really people are only totally fulfilled and totally properly imaging God if they are in a marriage relationship with a husband or wife but obviously that's not true. Paul, for example, recommends singleness as being a great thing. Being single is really good. If you could manage to be single, good. Jesus, of course, was never married to a human woman in this world. He is, of course, um, married in a spiritual sense to the church. But Jesus lived a single life here on this world too. So we have to be careful to say, like we don't we would we don't want to say, oh, if you're single, you're kind of less complete, right? That's that's horrible, and really bad theology, okay? But we do know from this passage that people are created to be with people, not 24 hours a day, seven days a week for our whole lives. People need time away from each other too, but we are created to be with people. But that being said, not only were people created to be with people, people were created to work with people. 
right? Adam and Eve, the Bible is very clear, were created to work the garden, to care for the garden, to take care of the animals, to take care of the plants. And that work, though it may have been hard, was not onerous to them. It was not a burden to them. Can you imagine having God bring all the animals and the birds and everything to you and getting to name them all? Right? I mean, it would be exhausting. That would be a lot of naming going on. Especially if you include all the insects. Right? Like, I can imagine, you know, Adam getting a little bit, like, tired by the time he comes to the dung beetle, right? He's like, <laughs> you roll around poop balls. Guess you're a dung beetle. <laughs> right? Right? But, so cool. So amazing. And this is what we get from God, too. God's bubbling love and joy flows out into the creation of the world, which wasn't necessarily easy work, although God is perfectly capable of doing it all with a snap of His fingers or a word from His mouth. But so much detail, so much care, so much attention, and, and knowing that He would not only create all these things, but He would have to sustain them moment by moment throughout all of history. And yet, out of the bubbling, overflowing love, He creates it all. And so too, when Adam is asked to be sovereign under God over creation, he names the animal. And, and he's hanging around all naked, not worrying about a thing, walking with God and talking with Him in the cool of the garden. Until, of course, things go wrong. Before we get to things going wrong, we need to mention one other thing though. You notice that there is a pattern that God sets out right in the very beginning. A pattern of work and rest. Work and rest. And that is a pattern that you see throughout Scriptures. Not only with the reality that God created everything and then He rests on the Sabbath day, He rested and made that day holy, but also in the pattern He established for the people of Israel and the pattern He established for us. Not only the, the weekly pattern of work and rest, but also the monthly pattern of celebrations and festivals and the yearly pattern of celebrations and festivals and holy days and also in the daily pattern of work and rest. It's interesting if it can remind you that in the Jewish calendar, in the Jewish way of looking at things, the day starts, uh, you guys remember this, when does the day start for the Jewish family slash person community. Sunset. That's when the day starts. Just when you are winding down, right? Just when you are, you know, having your evening meal, doing your prayers, doing some relaxing, going to sleep at your most vulnerable is when your day starts. In the rest, your day starts. And then when you get up in the morning, your day is already like half gone. <laughs> Makes you maybe feel stressed, I don't know. But then you go on and you do your work out of your rest. Right? So God establishes all these rhythms of work and rest and rest and work. But of course, that's not the end. And a good chunk of the rest of this sermon series will talk about sort of the, the bad and the ugly of work and how God is working to redeem those things for us. Because this is what we read. When Adam and Eve choose to eat from the fruit of the tree and God comes to see them, 
This is what he says to Adam. Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now this is not prescriptive. God is not saying this is how it should be from now on. God is describing this is how it will be as a consequence of what you have done. And this is where work right there in chapter 2 becomes disordered. Where all kinds of yuck creeps into the good of work. For now, brothers and sisters, let us remember that work was created good. Work was created good. It was created. It was something that God did. It was something that God passed on to us to do. And it was something that was created out of love and out of joy and out of abundance. And it was created for us to be something that was done in relationship. Relationship with God. Relationship with each other. And relationship with this world. For now, be encouraged as you go about your work this week. That work was created good. And that work is redeemed just as everything else is by our Savior, Jesus. Let us pray. Father in Heaven, we pray that as we go about the work that You have set aside for us in this week upcoming, that You would guide us. That You would help us to recover some of the joy in the, in the work that You give. That You would help us to recover the sense of relationship and love and stewardship that You have given us. That Your Spirit would help us to do even the most onerous of tasks with joy and with love. And Lord, we pray that You will open our hearts. That as in the coming weeks we learn more about work, that each and every one of us would experience the redemption of work that You have accomplished, Jesus, in Your life, death, and resurrection. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll invite the praise team to come forward and uh, we can sing our song of response.